Okay, good afternoon. Um, thanks for coming to my talk. I know there's other great options, and so I appreciate you stopping by and um, watching with me the live migration of a um, Java EE application based on WebSphere to a Cloud Foundry environment. As you can see, also here, there are two names listed. So one is myself, the other one is my colleague Torsten. Unfortunately, he had to cancel his trip in the night before the flight. He had to go to the hospital in an emergency. And um, this, uh, I don't know, the, uh, uh, he's doing better now, but was unable to travel. So um, quick shout out from my side. And I'm not sure if this is recorded and later on on YouTube, but you'll be missed, my friend. And um, it's not the same to stand up on the stage here on my own. <laughs> I wish you a speedy recovery. Um, this also had, of course, a bit of an effect on the, on the things that I want to show because we had kind of split the individual demo steps, so I had to align it a little bit. And um, now we're going to see how things go. So as I said, it is um, kind of a live demo. So there are almost no slides. I have a few slides um, just as a, like a visual representation of the things that I, that I try to do and try to show and where, this, where the thing is coming from. I should probably say we have done an initial presentation of this talk last year at the Cloud Foundry Summit in, in Basel. However, this was more on a talk in a conceptual way, why we did the individual things and how we approach it and so on. Um, and more about the, the technical backgrounds the one today is more about how we actually did it. So showing the steps that we, that we tried to do in order to get the job done. Um, so more on a, on a hands-on kind of thing. So if you have any further questions about why we came to that conclusion or why we did certain things that way, I'm happy to answer any questions in the end. Um, also, there will be a couple of like times where I deploy things and we have to wait a little bit and I can ha I'm happy to answer questions there as well. So. This is basically how the, um, the, the high-level overview of how things started. So initially, we had a web, or we still have that, an application running on a clustered web sphere in a local data center. And our, the desire of our client was basically to modernize this uh, application stack and run, this, run the software in, on a cloud-based platform, potentially develop in, in towards a microservice architecture. So it's pretty much like, here is our monolith, run it on the cloud for us, we don't care how, right? And um, so, well, this was new for us as well. This is the, we have done it a couple of times in the meantime, but this was like the experience report from the first time we did it. Um, the steps we're gonna show, first of all, um, WebSphere was not, we found WebSphere not to be the suitable application, like the um, application server runtime for, for microservices. So the first step would be to migrate from WebSphere to uh, WebSphere Liberty Profile. This is like a lightweight um, application server also with its roots in IBM. Um, after that, if this step goes fine, and it most likely will go fine, um, trying the Cloud Foundry approach. Cloud Foundry does have a community build pack for Liberty Profile, so that was an initial decision for us to, to take that direction. And then um, the first thing we did was trying to run it on a local development environment, like a PCF dev, still having it connected to the same backend services that we had at the time. And then the final step to get it running in the cloud was using a solution to run uh, on PCF on Azure. Um, and this case, of course, also involved not only the migration of the application side, but also of the backend services. So um, initially, the, um, the WebSphere landscape was connected to, a, to DB2. DB2, most likely not available on Azure as a managed service, so we did a migration to, um, to Postgres at the time. Okay, so um, about the application, um, it's a big uh, ear file. It has about 250,000 lines of code, so it's not the largest of all monoliths, but it's definitely bigger than a microservice, and um, it's, uh, it's, more, it's, in, it's a backend application from an automotive client that we serve, and um, most of the co incoming calls are being done through REST. There's also a bit of an, a web interface that I'm gonna show for, for validation, but it's not like a fancy UI application, it's mostly about data processing. 
So it does about a million requests in an, in an hour or so, so it's con under constant load, which also had an effect on our decisions in, in the migration. So the first step, as I said, is basically trying to take WebSphere out and bring Liberty in as a validation uh, to say if this is running on a, li on a, on a much lighter um, Java EE infrastructure than WebSphere is. And this is also like the recommended solution um, from both IBM and Pivotal to, to, to run those workloads in, in Cloud Foundry or in containers in general. And that's the, th the thing we tried to do. So um, is that big enough for the people in the background to read? If you cannot see it, raise your hands, please. Okay, I'll, <laughs> um, is it getting better? Okay. So I have a couple of folders here with the individual demo steps. So I'm not gonna show anything how the application is running in WebSphere. So I'm really starting at the point where I say, um, here is the ear file and we're gonna um, look at that. So the ear file is basically this one here. It has about 14 megabytes in size. So I should probably say this is like the real world code. Um, the only thing that we did was completely scramble it and take all the references out um, from the internal project names and, and custom name and so on um, in order to use it for such demo purposes. But it's not something we set up in a fake way to do a demo on that. So um, this is the, the real code of that application. Um, the first thing we did is there IBM provides a tool called um, the binary app scanner. And with this one will basically scan the EO file um, to check what kind of technologies we're internally using and if they are compliant with the Liberty runtime and what you need to basically do to enable them. So this is a um, Java application. I provide the, and I think it works like that. Okay, so it's, we're gonna go over that list and um, that feature list command will, um, will actually trigger um, an XML configuration to use later on with, um, with Liberty and it can also bring up a, um, a migration report file. This is something that I have done in advance in order to, to save some time here. So after executing this file, we're gonna get this one. And if I look into that, these are like the features that it has detected from a Java E technology perspective, which we would then in turn need to, um, to, to run it in a, to run it in a Liberty profile. Now looking at that web page real quick, um, this is a long website that you're gonna get, this application migration report. So it will basically check um, if it finds certain platforms to be compliant to run it with. This will also evaluate the individual technologies that you use, and it will also describe a couple of things that it found that you say, well, this runs on WebSphere, but it's not running on a Liberty, so please have a look into that to, um, to update your code. I'm just gonna close that section. It also, I mean, this shows the content of the file. I think it would be pointless for you to throw something in the code, but just to give you an impression of what the complexity of the application kind of is. And um, it's a good analysis tool for the application in general, but very helpful also for the migration. In the end, it will come up with these features, and these are the features that we basically use then to, for the application migration. So I'm trying to show that now. Um, what, you, what you're gonna have to come up with in the end is a so-called server XML file. And the, on the top of the server XML file, you explicitly you list those features, like EJBs, JND, JNDI, what kind of security things, and so on. Basically everything your application needs and what you can take from the, uh, from the scanning. What you can't take from the scanning are your application-specific properties, like if you set JNDI entries for yourself or if you connect to a database. So right here you get like the reference to the, to the DB2 um, that your application can connect in the same way it would be kind of dangerous if the application scanner could read out the passwords and so on. So these are the things that you have to set by yourself. So it's a combination basically of features and configuration. After this one is done, you can basically um, run the thing. So the, we have, I have written a, a little script to, um, to do that. So the, um, the important command is basically liberty's bin server run and then uses that file. 
in the beginning, we just copy a few files because I've done a bit of local development here to, um, to adapt for this demo. That's why I put it into the script file. So I should probably also mention I have a DB2 running in a Docker container. I hope it is running in the Docker container. Yes, it is. Um, this one I will try to connect to. The only thing I have to validate quickly is um, the network connection because this, um, this is how the application connects and this IP is different from the one in my hotel and at home, but it looks like it hasn't changed again, so this is good. Um, that means I can run this. And um, now Liberty will basically come up. Um, you will see the, the output of the logs files. It's probably not gonna tell you much or not as much as it, as it tells me. Um, so in the meantime, I can give a bit of an idea of, of why we did things that way. As I said before, um, the, the application is under very heavy load and it was not a good, not an easy thing for us. Can I just, I need to have an eye on that a little bit. Um, so it says initialization successful. I'm gonna continue with that story later um, because now I can, uh, I should be good to show it. I just need to scroll back a little and see, it will basically say at some point where the application is running and what port is bound to. So this is the one right here. And if I go to my browser again and put the URL in, then I'm basically getting the, uh, the, the UI of that application. So um, it basically is a registry for the vehicles, users, partners, and so on. I mean, we're not really interested in what the application does internally, just to show that things are, are, can be run that way. So that means the first part of the migration has then finished. So we know we can run the application on Liberty now um, and have a look at the further steps. So the next thing would be to make it run on Cloud Foundry. And um, we used PCF Dev a lot for like local development. That means what, what we did was running PCF Dev on the local environment, just leave the database as it is um, and not run it with the Liberty profile in that way, but using that Liberty build pack and run the application on top of that. So um, I should probably also mention we didn't connect to DB2 as, as a user provided service as Cloud Foundry would, pro as it would be a best practice in Cloud Foundry, we basically just connected straight over the network just to see if the application um, service um, or the, the, the application can connect successfully. All right, so to save some memory, if this works, okay, I'm, I'm gonna stop this application. Um, and go over to the um, PCF. Now, from a configuration perspective, we left pretty much the server XML unchanged um, as it was connecting to the same database on, on the same host and on the same port. I mean, the only thing we really had to uh, set up is the, the, manif the manifest file. Um, and so what we specified was about two gigs of RAM, uh, one, uh, one gig of disk, specified that, that zip file where the application is contained and explicitly spe uh, picked the, the build pack that we need to run. So as you can see, this is take coming from GitHub from the Cloud Foundry, um, from the Cloud Foundry space, um, is, is, is a community thing. What you can see in the bottom here is just like IBM licensing information that you have to put in for um, making your liberty work. Okay, so, now, as you are all here on the Cloud Foundry Summit, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with this command. Um, but before I do it, I just wanna check if I'm connected to the right platform at the moment. So this is PCF dev, yeah, this is good. So I'm going to execute a CF push. Um, this will probably take a bit of time. I still have 18 minutes left for my overall migration, so that, that's looking good. Um, what will be happening now is First of all, the, um, the Liberty container or like the instance will be created. Then it will have to detect what kind of features are required. Those features are gonna be installed then. And in the end, it will come up with a droplet um, that holding the Liberty application runtime and the application on top. So um, as it is quite heavy, as you have seen before, 
we, um, we specified two, two gigs of RAM, which we found to be su sufficient for that purpose. Now, as we wait on that, I can still uh, come finish on the thing that I tried to explain before. Um, a lot of people have asked us, why did we do this approach and not like try to rewrite things either in Spring Boot or create microservices and so on. And the primary reason for that is, as I said before, we, um, the application is live in production and is under constant and heavy load. So um, rewriting stuff as microservice would have meant for us um, to have like a split development team for like maintaining the, the, the legacy application and, and running the, and creating the new one. On the other hand, um, we, we said if, if we can come to a way that we have the same code base that we run on, app, on, on WebSphere and on Liberty, then we already know we have like a proper tested code because like this code base is always running in production and live. And so we can't, we shouldn't expect too many difficulties in that on the cloud side. So the, the overall goal was still like to, to get it running on the cloud as a, as a monolith. And once we're there, starting to take benefits of, of a cloud platform, like automatic restart, scaling, and so on. Um, but the first intention was to really get it there in, in the same shape. Also, what we found is that, especially um, running those tests and making it compliant for Liberty, Liberty is, um, is kind of stricter in enforcing um, Java EE or like Java in general policies. And um, webs like the, the same code, sometimes Liberty would complain about something that WebSphere tolerated. So in the end, we, we actually, this helped us to make our code a little cleaner. So once we got it running for Liberty, it was absolutely running, running fine on WebSphere. And um, this is basically um, the, the, the point where we wanted to go to. Now I can see, well, as we wait on this, are there any questions I can answer right now? Are you all good to follow? Um, I, it, it normally takes around four or five minutes on the first run. And then once you, once you start and stop the individual instance later on, it's like in, in a time frame of about 30 seconds to a minute, uh, which is a, lot, a big improvement to what we had compared to the original WebSphere environment where the startup time was about five minutes or so. Now, if this should, for some whatever reason, not come up um, in the desired time frame, I also have a... Yes. Okay, so repeating the question, if I understood it correctly, um, it's like if you find out during the migration process if the application is too big that you can't migrate it. I mean, in general, we now we have to find out what too big means. I mean, there is no size limitation, so on. I mean, technically, you can run everything in a container. You can run a web server in a container. It just doesn't make any sense. So um, this is the thing you need to really be careful of is trying to comply with the 12-factor app guidelines, and in particular, to get in-memory state out of the application. This is basically uh, one thing we, we, um, we, it took us a bit of time to validate that we have the sa same instances um, scaled, that they like they're doing this, the same thing in, in, in the same way. Um, but from a, from a size perspective, in terms of lines of code or whatsoever, there is no limitation. If, you're, if this application runs on WebSphere and doesn't really use any particular libraries which don't exist there, then um, it will run on Liberty as well. In case if you get in such a scenario that it's really something very, I don't know, legacy prone and you can't run it anywhere else, then this approach will not work. But we have done it for a couple of applications so far and um, the, the, mo the main effect we normally had was really just, it helped us clean up our monolith code in the first place and once we had it migrated, then it was kind of easy to kick off new de development and write new microservices alongside of it and deploy it on the same platform or cut out microservices from the existing monolith. So um, it says here, waiting for the app to start, um, I'm going to, yeah. <laughs> so it actually, this one already says it has started. Um, let me just 
uh, check the logs real quick. So this is still saying it is starting, container became healthy. Well, this one will actually say it has failed. I think it, it runs in a timeout or something because it takes lo longer than the 300 seconds or, or whatever it, it has. But as you can see on the logs on the right-hand side, it is still in the process of, of, of doing that and um, will eventually become healthy. So um, I can already prepare for that and say I have CF apps. Then my link will be ntlinklocal.pc. Okay. And opening that here. This, oh, right, it's a need to specify the other port. Right, so there it is. Um, I just, this is the same application that you have seen before. And as the URL reveals, this is not a fake. It is running on my local PCF environment now, which, which basically tells me, okay, now I have validated. It's not only Liberty compliant, it's also Cloud Foundry compliant. And the next step would then be, how am I gonna get this um, into like a uh, enterprise level cloud? So looking at my windows. So that means we try to stay on a platform level with, with Pivotal Cloud Foundry, but we should remove the dev and switch it to a, a proper installation of Pivotal Cloud Foundry running on Microsoft Azure and um, tie it then to a Postgres database. Um, so what that basically means, what we have to do is um, do that database migration. I mean, this is a part that I cannot show here completely. Um, I can just tell you what the steps you need to do from platform side in order to get there. So I'm going to close this. I can let the other one run. Now I'm going to change the target. This is an environment that I um, got provided from our friends at, at Pivotal to, um, to demonstrate that. And I hope the network is good enough, right? That looks good. So it says PCF Azure. Um, this is my endpoint and where I am connected. So um, basically what you need to do is um, get yourself a database service. And this is basically something we found really helpful running on that platform. So um, I can open up the apps manager here. I'm sure most of you have seen something like that. And um, you can also make this, uh, sorry, make this bigger. And if you go to services here and you basically want to add a service, um, you get all the, the, the Azure provided backend services directly like as native Cloud Foundry services. You can just invoke them with a simple CF create command and the, in, in the back end, the, the, the services will be created for you. And once you, once you tie it to the application, all the connection information and credentials are going to be injected. So this, this one made it really, really smooth for us to, to get there. So it's just that service creation, there was one too many, takes a bit of time. I mean, this, um, it, no, I think in the background, they will probably spin up a VM and put the database there. So for, for this case, I have already created one, uh, which I called the PSQL test. Um, it, um, and, and now basically we need to access it from the outside and run our initial configuration scripts for that database to make sure it, it will be running uh, together with that application. So, um, I have also on the application side, I think I can take this one out. Well, I can actually use it. So I, I'm, I'm gonna save us the time of the CF push again. That would be a similar thing. So the, the, the thing you should do in the first place then, uh, do a CF push with a no start option. So that will basically just create the application and push the code, but it's not gonna start any instances yet. Um, just basically as the one you can see here, which I called anti-link backup. 
And um, then you can do a bind service. This, I guess it's the app name and then it's the service name. And the service name was PSQL test. So it will probably tell me that I had the need to restage. Um, did I? Oh, it's backup, it's not service. So yeah, it tells me to restage. This is something I don't really care about. What I really care about is I can now check the environment variables of my application. And um, with that, it will tell me all the connection information um, that got injected to the application from, um, from Azure. So I can see up here, um, this is basically the URL where the application, where the database backend is really running. I got the configuration for username, password, and so on. This is basically what is generated internally by the platform and injected to the application. So from an application perspective, the end user will never have to deal with that. Um, and I'm just going to change the directory here. And this will have a, a bit of an effect on the, on the server XML. So in the server XML, you can then say, the database name is just like cloud services and then PSQL backup or PSQL test or whatever name your, your, your database connection is. And all of that will be injected to the application and will not have to be configured out of there. Um, also what it means for us is um, we, can, we can leverage that to um, connect to the database and configure it in the first place. So I have a, another script to do that. I think it's called restore PSQL. Okay, so I need to split my screen here real quick and um, repeat this. So this is something I will most likely not get done until the end of this talk. And it was probably a bit too challenging idea to do a, micro, uh, um, a monolith migration in 30 minutes. But um, I, I just want to make sure I, I show you all the, the steps that, that we did in there. And now I have, I will execute this call. Um, oh wait, like, so I have to do the cut. And uh, PSQL minus U, the username which has just been created is this one. The um, database is, I'm forgetting, a, um, it should be a host name as well. Give me a second, I need to. minus database, this is the database name. This is the host name. So you, normally you do that only once, right? <laughs> um, and so I got user host name and maybe the port, 5432. And if things, if I didn't do a type, so no, it's ask me for the password. And I also find the password here somewhere. Yeah, I got it, thanks. Yeah, and entering that now should hopefully give me the access. And um, no. Well, I mean, just Trust me that this will normally work. Uh, <laughs> it's a bit too, too much com uh, command line tweaking right here. I'll, I'll try it later on. Before I do that, 
I just want to show you that this actually works. If you, as you might have noticed, I've already deployed an, an, an application there um, to show you that this is actually running. Um, this, is, this is the one right here. And um, going back to my browser, um, putting this in and say app to admin. And then you see it's the same application now running on PCF on Azure, connecting to that database. If, I mean, you could actually validate this as a public URL. You would be able to access it on, or from your mobile phone, so this is, this is not a setup. And from, from that point on, this was a, a very effective means also for, for the customer. So when we, when we wanted to show like the state, we just, just send them an, an, an email with the link and say, here, access your application, please. It's the, the migration has been done to that point. It was also very good to like test the application, now having it running on, on Cloud Foundry. And we could, it, like, um, in a continuous way, work out if there were any problems, trying to do scaling, doing blue-green deployments, and all the, 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 the typical benefits that you would have from such a platform. All right, I'm getting down with, um, the, with the time, I think. So um, I just wanted to re recap the couple of steps what we did. First to Liberty then to PCF Dev using Liberty, then to PCF, PCF on Azure using Liberty. If you're interested more in the backgrounds why we did this, the, the, the talk from Torsten and I from um, Basel last year, you can find on YouTube. You can also catch me later. Um, I will, I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions. I just have another talk at 4 o'clock, so that I might be busy then. The only thing I want to say thanks to my colleagues, um, Tobias Wischisch and Konstantin, because they have been helping me to set up the, um, to set up the, the, the mocked code. And one thing I would just really quickly, could everybody raise their hand who wishes Torsten a speedy recovery? Because then I'll, I, I'll send this photo to him and I'm pretty sure, thanks, that was very, very kind. Um, he was, yeah, he was very, disappointed that he couldn't make it here um, and I'm sure like all, all your sympathy will then make him recover a lot faster. So um, I don't know what the timing looks like. Th yeah so I think maybe two questions in here would be fine and then we could definitely take some more outside. Y the lady was first. Um, okay, the question was that we initially used DB2 and where it then went when we migrated to Cloud Foundry. So, okay, this is my timer. It tells me that I'm done. <laughs> um, we, we, we lost DB2 at the PCF dev step. Um, so initially, WebSphere was connecting to DB2, Liberty was connecting to DB2, and the initial version uh, running on PCF dev was also connected to DB2. At that point, we were already able to like spin up the, uh, the Postgres SQL in parallel. And I mean, this one, of course, required some modification in the application. This step I couldn't demo here, but it's like, um, we, we did that POC on, on PCF dev to validate it, it, it works against PSQL2. And then I created the PSQL instance on Azure running that initial configuration script. And that would be the same way as you can load the data into it. Make sense now? What? Yes. So the, like the, 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 the data migration part is not content of this talk. So I mean, I, I, the, the way I'm, the, what I did here was just basically initializing the database um, that um, the application can connect to it and work with it, but it didn't, um, it, I didn't migrate the data. Yeah, that, that's, that's a pretty tough thing to do. That, yes, this might, might be stuff for another talk. <laughs> okay, you had a question too? Um, I mean, it was a bit, I mean, they, as the things were not running in the same networks, so this had, a, of course, an impact on, well, the question basically was uh, about the performance differences between initial web sphere and then running on the cloud later on. The, well, this was kind, kind of hard to measure because we had like a direct data center access on the web sphere side, and then um, for the POC, we were running on a public Azure. I can only say we didn't notice any significant 
degradation or something like that. So the application responded in, in a similar way as it did before. Um, we, uh, we, we, we did some comparisons running it by, like locally on a web sphere and then on a Liberty. And yeah, that uh, didn't do any, any harm to that. Yes. Is there any, you know, down the road tooling is there based around it? Um, well, this, the, 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 the reason why I showed it that way is that it wor will work this way all the time. I mean, um, IBM provides additional tooling. Uh, well, the one I showed was command line generating the report. There is not a tooling where you can plug in into an eclipse and it will highlight the pieces in the code that you actually have to migrate. So that would be somewhat more visual. But, well, the C CF thing, you can, of course, start an application through the Apps Manager and upload it this way, but um, I wanted to have it in a, in a generic way, so a couple of things can definitely be done different, yeah. So there are ways? There are ways, yeah. Okay. There is just no, like, end-to-end -end migration tooling yet, which basically takes a monolith and then comes back with something which is already running and connected to a different database. If, if I had that, uh, that would be very good. But uh, it would, would take me out of my job then. OK, so thanks all for listening. And um, as you are all experienced Cloud Foundries already, um, I have another talk which is in the one-on-one -on -one section at 4.30 if you're interested. But I expect most of you to know that already. OK, thanks a lot. <laughs>